What's happening, everyone? Before this next Lego podcast show starts, this is a reminder to you not to be a minge bag. Go over to Patreon, sign up for a pound a week, and take advantage of all the Patreon perks. It is the Patreon that pays. We have a betting show on a Saturday, which the postman here is picking winners every single week. Yeah, the betting show comes out Saturday mornings, covers UFC and boxing, footy when we're um, within the footy season. But yeah, we're winning on a weekly basis. I can't remember the last week we didn't find some sort of winner. So yeah, as Andy says, don't be a minge bag, come and get involved. And as I say, it's one of the best communities that you could be a part of, isn't it? It's a belter. As well as the betting show on a Wednesday, me and George have a chat. That's where you might have seen on our Insta reels about Crocs, about harpooning people at the end of the night, all that kind of chat that goes on. And even better, every single Wednesday, we do a raffle draw and our sponsors, Montrex, give a hundred pound gift voucher away just for being on Patreon. No better time to join. There's 30 plus episodes already that you can go back and watch. Again, no better time. Get involved. Don't be a minge bag. Pound a week and we'll see you there. Right, welcome to the Lego Podcast. It's me, Jordan Neal. It's me, Andy Grant. And this week's guest is Kevin Ajako. What's happening? I'm good. I'm, you know right? I'm good, yeah. Adopted Scouser, no? Adopted Scouser, yeah. <laughs> um, before we kick off, dead quick, all our sponsors. We've got Montrex, we've got Ver Clothing, and we've got Health Kit Kitchen. All the links in the bio, all Liverpool companies. Go and support them. And if you're listening to this, you could have listened to it about a week ago if you were signed up on Patreon. It's a pound a week, and by doing so, you're automatically entered into a £100 raffle every week with Monterex. Loads of perks on it. You get an extra show with me and Jordan. Jordan does a betting show over weekend. Last weekend, he got six out of six on the MMA. Someone won about two grand off a 71 accumulator. Um, it was flying. So get involved. It's the Patreon that pays and come and support the boys. Right, enough of that, mate. I'm a big fan of boxing. Um, and Jordan's raved about you a few times. A few of the betting shows that we've done, your name's, been, uh, <laughs> your name's popped up. And uh, Jordan's been telling me about you, mate, the last week or two. So I'm excited to, uh, to meet you. So nice one. Yeah, I'm obviously been uh been fighting for a long time now but just moved to liverpool to start training camp um i used to train in london so i kind of thought that i needed a change in, in scenery and, and coaching and stuff and yeah glad to be up in liverpool now so how long have you been up here for um so i come over when was it i think it was the start of august just to try things out see if it suited me and then i went back home for a week or two to make a decision then yeah i've been i've been here for the last two three weeks now uh obviously started camp so I'm going to have fake news dropping soon but yeah I've been here for like two three weeks enjoying it yeah I love it it's just very similar like I keep saying it's very similar to, to Belfast back home so um, the people very similar the, the city similar so yeah I'm, I'm loving it it's, it's great Good days. going back to the start you um, you grew up in London for the first part of your life yeah so um, yeah so I was born in London lived there until I was seven um, and then my mum's from Belfast so we moved back to Belfast obviously when I was seven and then yeah, I've just been a Belfast boy that's ever some, since. That's some change, isn't it? London to Belfast. Yeah, like, London. I mean, I guess it's like London to <laughs> Liverpool, isn't it? I mean, when I go to London, like, got to be honest, I hate it. I just can't. Like, yeah. It's too much for me. But. Do you know what? It was tough being there for four and a half years training. Yeah. Um, especially living in, in Belfast. It's a quiet city, do you know what I mean? And then you go into such a busy city like London and a very expensive city in that as well. So, yeah, it's... I didn't mind it, but I didn't... I hated going over for training camps. Just yeah. like I loved the training, but just going to London and like somewhere that will take literally it should take twenty minute drive will take you an hour. Do you know mm. what I mean? Stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it wasn't great living there. What's that transition like from se- at like seven years old or going from like London to to Belfast? Is are you like too naive to really understand it, or is it still a big change? Um, I'd say it's still a big change. Like I, we always flew back and forth because my family's from Belfast. Um, my big brother has always lived in Belfast, so um, as young kids, me and my siblings, we we always kind of flew back to my granny's house and stuff like that. But obviously, moving permanently is quite different because you've got a a mixed race family moving to the heart of West Belfast with English accents. Mm. Um, and then them um, times, I think it was only what that was two thousand five, two thousand six, kind of just freshly six seven years off the, the good friday agreement um so yeah it was kind of it was different do you know what i mean um it was i wouldn't like to say we weren't welcome but you got the odd kind of it was always we always got called like british whatever so and so's but we always seen ourselves as ours so it didn't really affect us mm. um but yeah it was tough but once everyone kind of got to know us and everyone knew my family and stuff it was it was good i had a good childhood growing up in belfast what was the much racism growing up in, in ireland or um 
Not not really, you know. Um, it's something I think as someone white in Liverpool, it's something that, I don't know, I automatically assume because yeah. no one I know is racist. You, I think sometimes naive enough to think, oh, it's not, it doesn't go on or it's not as yeah. bad as it maybe once was and you forget that. It, 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 it could be, but just different perceptions of it. You know, yeah, I, do you know what? Like, obviously, like I said, we're, one of the first mixed race families growing up in, in West Belfast, like, there wasn't, there was very, very rarely any mixed race um, kids or black kids or families um, in Belfast at that time. So it was kind of new, but you got the odd, the odd racist comment growing up um, or in school or something like that, but it wasn't like it was constant or every single day, do you know what I mean? It was once in a blue moon. Mm. Do you know, being sort of like, as you say, you know, mixed race family, and, and but is that where like boxing became an option or was it like, did you just enjoy um, So my, my granny's house is actually facing the, the amateur gym that I, I box for. My my uncle used to fight there. So it was just in my granny's house. And one yeah. day my, my mom brought me and my brother over there and was just to show us where my uncle had boxed and just put gloves on and have a look back since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just like, it's one of them things, isn't it? Like you see it in Liverpool all the time, sort of, you know, we grew up in like, you know, on council estates and stuff. It's like, it, it's always there as, you know, so it's like this beacon of light, isn't yeah. it? You know, if you are going to have trouble laying out to defend yourself. And um, I was just wondering whether that was, whether it was a conscious decision for your family to go, like, you're going to need to go and defend you yourself just in case, yeah. or whether it was just, you know, something I that... think, I don't know if that was one of my mum's reasons in, in putting us in. I, I mean, for me, it was always my uncle boxed and that's where we were brought. But maybe there was a reason behind why she brought us to the gym. Um, like, we used to play football and stuff growing up, so we were very active kids. Um but yeah, I think maybe it was obviously being mixed race and at that time still had my English accent and stuff like or London accent and stuff like that. So maybe it was just to be mm. able to defend ourselves if, if anything happened. Mate, your accent now as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Considering, you know, you spent seven years, you know, your formative years yeah. not in Ireland, you you speak very Irish. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> well, that's it. Like obviously I think because I moved to Belfast when I was so young, mm. obviously I've I've lived in Belfast way longer than I and I lived in London, so I kind of quickly developed the Belfast accent because I've I've got friends that live in Belfast that are from London, and they actually they moved to Dublin when they were quite young, and then they moved back to London, and then they moved to Belfast, but they've still got their English accent. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I lost <laughs> mine very quickly. <laughs> is boxing as big in? Obviously, I it's just sort of for people who don't really understand it. But is boxing as big as people say in Belfast? Oh, in yeah. term, it is. You, it's like Liverpool, isn't you, it? You ever box? play f- football or you play Gaelic or yeah. Ireland like our sports um, that, do you know what I mean uh, uh, like or someone in someone's family has been a boxer do you know what I mean it's it's massive in, in Belfast mm. and in Ireland and um, they love their fighting do you know what I mean they're fighting Irish so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's the um, I think it was was it Conlon who done Croke Park I remember um, just like he's walking out and Falls Park yeah. Falls Park yeah, yeah, yeah sorry yeah he was um, and it was just sort of like don't know the passion that they show. It's just so so natural, though, isn't it? I mean, you look at American shows sometimes, and it, it might be a little bit built up, or the volume gets like yeah. put up a little bit. But there, it was just pure nah, passion. Like. Yeah, like Colin has headlined the, the Falls Park twice, and that's yeah. like literally like the Falls Park is a stone throw away from my granny's house from oh, from, okay. uh, from my amateur club. Um, but it's like ten thousand people outside arena. Like it's it's unbelievable, and just everyone singing and like chanting and whatever else. And yeah, it's it's a it, like being there in that atmosphere. It's it's unbelievable. The comparisons to Liverpool, I find, it's the back in your own thing, isn't it? I yeah. mean, like if you if you're coming out of a place like Belfast, then you have got something going for you in sport. They're gonna get behind yeah. you, like. And exactly. Yeah. I've, I mean, I've got a great fan base back in Belfast, and um, like that was one of the des- decisions to move to Bel- or to Liverpool is I know it's a fighting city do you know what I mean and they, they support their own and uh, that, well my coaches and stuff and I call me the Scouse Thunder instead of Black <laughs> Black Thunder but um, yeah it's, it was one of the, one of the decisions and because it was so similar to, to Belfast do you know what I mean like the, the people are very similar they, they it's a fighting city they support their own and stuff like that and mm. it's just like back home I think it's interesting that probably the same set for Belfast as well. But we were joking the other day, and if you, you know, if you're from Liverpool and you happen to be, you know, the best at whatever you do, whether it's football, boxing, if you are the best in Liverpool at that particular sport, the chances are you'll probably be best, one of the best in the country. Yeah. Because the talent is that high in the city, and I guess it's exactly the same as Belfast. Yeah, definitely. Like, if you're if you're the best, I mean, it's you're, you're going to be the best in the country. Do you know what I mean? Belfast is very small, so even though there's so many fighters coming out of, yeah. out of the city right now, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a 
it's at right now it's probably at the peak it's mm. ever been do you know what I mean it's just at the highest and there's so much talent coming out of Belfast at the moment mm. obviously you were um, you were a, like a decorated amateur how comp- obviously you went starting at well, how old was you when you walked in the gym seven so you yeah. so it was literally from straight off how quickly did it become like I'm, I'm good at this in terms of like this is a um, so I started when I was seven so me and my brother started um, and there's a year between us we walked in the gym, everyone called him Muhammad Ali and me Joe Fraser because I just loved to scrap. I just I was a little fat kid, just loved to fight. And he was skinny, naturally talented, just literally gifted. Um, but I always had that hard, like, I had the heart and the hard work and just wanted to work hard and just loved to scrap. So I think the first couple of years of boxing, I always remember not going to like weigh-ins and just going to football matches instead because I used to play football. So this, I prefer to go to a football match on a Saturday rather than weigh-in for a competition. And then it was one, like I'd, I'd see my brother obviously like weighing for competitions and like taking it serious and, and winning and stuff. And I was like, fuck, I want to do that. Do you know what I mean? So um, I was like, I'll take this serious. Weighing in, I was useless. I was so shit. I was just a little fat kid that, <laughs> that, that, that could scrap. I just loved to have a tear up. Um, but I remember it was one one year, I was like 12, 13, and in our gym, the the seniors only train in the summer, so all the like juniors and youths and stuff aren't allowed to train. The seniors are getting like ready for a big year, and I remember pleading with my amateur coach, like, can I train with the seniors? Like, please, I'll, like, I'll not mess about, I'll, I'll put the work in. And he was like, yeah, fair, okay. And that's the year that I literally got good. I just trained one one year with the seniors who were like probably five, six years older than me and I used to spar them all. Obviously they would take it a bit late, but I used to spar them all and that year was the year that I got good. The, the following year I went to the, the World and Europeans and I say when I was 13, 14 is whenever I realised I've got some sort of talent and if I keep to like keep on working hard I can um, achieve something and, and make this my job. So yeah, when I went to the Worlds at like 13, or at 14, uh, I realised I was good at this. It's a little bit of a masterstroke from your amateur coach to like yeah. put you in with people, I guess, who are better than you at the time, and like sort of, you know, you feel like we all do it in professional lives or whatever. When you're around people who maybe, you know, you perceive to be as good or better than you, mm. it does make you naturally go right. I can't do anything. Yeah. I can't well, take I think me out of the ball. From a young age, I've always been competitive and somebody that I've always wanted to prove myself in life. No matter what it is, I like I do. I always want to show how good I am or how good I can be and from a young age I think my coach seen that in me like with me if you tell me I'm not going to beat somebody I will train as hard as I possibly can I'll prove you wrong as where with someone like my brother at the time if you, he needed to be told he would win to win do you know what I mean mm. so like my coach put me in with the seniors he knew that I would like give it my all and, and try and be competitive against them and that played a big part in who I am today because it made me a better fighter, do you know what I mean? Mm. Trying to step up to mm. that level and um, yeah, you just knew how to kind of coach that. Two things on that, it's, I do like a little cheesy saying and it's, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, you need to change rooms yeah. and it's, it sounds like exactly that. But the thing I love there about boxing as well, it's the kind of man management. And I've heard stories of like, you know, coaches who kind of, you know, given you that advice, but then there's other coaches like maybe your brother. And I've heard stories where like, they'll give like kids like a smarty or something. And they'd be like, right, this this thing, you know, it's gonna give you more energy or whatever. And yeah. you know, and that kid's thinking, I've got this, you know, special tablet's gonna make me, you know, not give in or whatever. And just knowing what the coach, knowing his fighter, to say, he needs to be told you're gonna win, or you need to be told actually, lad, you need to mm. fucking. I love that about coaching. Yeah, and that's the beauty of, of especially like something like boxing because I've grown up seeing that, like, and and obviously experiencing myself where there's certain there's way to kind of manipulate someone's mind into making them believe or like for me like you tell me I can't do so you tell me I mm. can't go and run a 10 mile jog and, and a certain time I'm going to go and do it like I'm somebody that likes to prove some people wrong but then again if you tell somebody they're going to win and you kind of make them believe in themselves then they'll go and perform mm. better as well if you say to them like this guy's going to beat you or this is going to be a very very tough fight or they kind of crumble under that mm. you know what I mean so yeah that's the beauty of kind of boxing like and and certain coaches for me I, I had the best amateur coach in, in Ireland um, and he just knew how to deal with different fighters and, and make them the best mm, when you delve into combat sports though it's such a big thing that like Leon Edwards and oh, yeah. like, like when his, his coach mm. got in they just give him because they knew that he would react in a way of like 
you know, don't tell me that I'm I'm just throwing it away or whatever. But yeah. you know, sometimes you'll see it, and from the outside, and you'll see coaches there who are maybe just trying to protect the fact that they've got a job with a certain fighter. You know, they, yeah, they won't yeah. say any home truths, and I just think that's where that's what separates the fact that there's only probably you know a very minor percentage of coaches who will ever go down as like they were elite. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because they they just they say it how it is, and it's so important. Do you know? Um, there's an interesting book called Outliers, and it's basically about. Um, it's talking about successful kind of people that we know of and it's almost a bit like a a chance opportunity in many cases for example you talk about the Beatles they got signed by um, a guy who took them off to Germany in the early years and they were playing in Hamburg you know far more than they would have if they'd stayed in Liverpool so yeah. you're getting far more practice he makes an example of Bill Gates and Bill Gates happened to grow up in a community where his mum kind of lived close to a college and they had access to computers where no one else did etc so with you saying you had the best Irish coach, do you think that that's obviously played a part in your life or do you think you would have went on this road wherever? No, I wouldn't be the third I am today without without my amateur coach. I wouldn't be the man I am today without my amateur coach. Mm. Like, just this, I always refer back to stuff that he told me early on in my career. Like, and I was just naive and like stubborn and argumentative and just didn't listen to him that plays parts of my my life now and I'm like I always think back like, Mickey told me this like and I didn't believe him then and like certain advice he'd give me and I wouldn't listen to and like then I kind of refer back to then and be like he told me this to me so yeah like with, without my amateur coach I, I wouldn't be the person or, mm. or the the fighter I am today like I, when I'm back home I, I still go up to the gym like and I, he's someone that you you can be around and you'll learn something new off him every single day whether it's boxing or just something life in life advice. In, 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 yeah, yeah life advice he's someone that you just learn something off uh, every day and he's yeah he's played a massive part in my, in my career in my life Maybe, cool. I think that's the biggest compliment for boxing in, yeah. it, in terms of like you know the first thing you said then you quickly changed the direction to like I wouldn't have been the man I am Yeah, I think that's like the biggest compliment mm. because yes you've learned how to defend yourself you've you know you're incredibly fit you've, you've got a great career but like the fact that someone who meets you at such a young age in like what is, I know you pay subs or whatever but it's, it's, it's accessible to everyone isn't it mm. and it can change the course of your life just yeah. through meeting somebody who's, who's in a boxing gym it's, yeah, it's amazing it's insane it? yeah and like, like boxing coaches don't get enough credit especially in the amateurs because you don't get paid for it do you no. know what I mean you're bringing kids in off the street and you're changing their lives do you know what I mean and you're trying to teach them discipline and, and dedication and stuff and they, they, they don't get enough credit for, for what they do it's like it's, I hate the fact that it's just thrown to the side like it is so in any other walk of life if like a method had the, the success rate boxing has they would, people would be like right we need to take this and make it bigger mm, yeah. for example if it was a business oh yeah we need but to maximise this and roll it out more and more yeah, if, and, if yeah. like A plus B was profit whereas you know A plus B in terms of young person boxing gym and success if that was in any other walk of life the government and the stuff would be like yeah, yeah. like do blow to this but for some reason it's still like like blacklisted I just don't mm. get it I think it could it gets a bad reputation because it is a dangerous sport mm. do you know what I mean you're taking punches like I remember there was something about Eddie Hearn was on some, some show talking to somebody about it not being allowed in schools oh yeah and I don't agree with that like like I used to go to my back to my school my, my secondary school and teach boxing to the kids and they always loved it and it's just you learn so much from boxing discipline mm. dedication hard to defend yourself even just staying fit, learn about that and nutritionist and stuff like that. It, there's so much to learn from it, so it's something that I think should mm. be t- taught in every single school. I always think back to my school because I obviously growing up in Liverpool, you either play football or you did boxing, and I always remember the lads who boxed at a high level. They never fought at school. No, they never. They were never in mm. fights. It was like it was the lads who sort of wanted to be boxers that would fight. Yeah, and it, they. I don't know what it was, but I feel like at a young age you're taught in terms of like you know. You, you learn that here but you don't do it yeah. unregulated I think as well like for me when people used to te- like push my buttons in school I've got nothing to prove mm. like I know I could beat you up that, and for me that's enough for me do you know what I mean mm. as where well, people who don't do boxing or they're kind of insecure about themselves and they feel like they have to prove that or do you know what I mean or yeah. they have to go out and, and fight and show everyone that they can't and the one will mess with them as well for me it was I don't have to prove anything to anybody do you know yeah. I, mean? I know I know I can handle in myself confidence, yeah. yeah I know I've I know I'm skilled in a certain sport do you know what I mean that I don't need to go yeah. and prove that I think kids need that inner confidence in this generation more than yeah. anyone that's mm. ever been yeah. and I think right. that's, that's why it should be so big but you say you were going to like world and European championships at 12 and 13 That that's like a 
<laughs> that's not normal is it yeah well 14 14 yeah. I was so um yeah going for me it was it was crazy because like I said I went from like, just this little fat kid that could only fight to the year after being a, a skilled fighter that kind of knew what he was doing but so in, in the amateurs you have like the novices so it's like five fights and under so the same year that I won the novices I went to the world and Europeans so I'd, I was like I had 12 fights or something and everyone else on the Irish team had multiple national titles and like 30 40 fights is where i was just and I, I was one of the fighters that did one of the, like the best in the competitions you know i mean I, I just i lost out both both times to the to the winner in the europeans and, and the world in close fights for medals and it was just like my career just got just went from there to there like so very quick like i was one of the the top talents on, on the irish team and yeah at a, at a young age you know what i mean it was it was unreal are you ever are you allowed to like rest on your models sort of thing? If, you know, you say you've got success really early as like an Irish international. Are you ever allowed to like, you know, get comfortable with that, or are you just being pushed constantly to like get better? And uh... um, so for me, within myself, I I don't I just like that's if I want to fight that's in the past. Mm-hmm. I've got to do better to get to the next level. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I feel like if you start getting comfortable, you become complacent. Do you know what I mean? And then you can you'll see dips in your there's a dip, like I'm very very confident I'm not cocky at all but I'm, I'm confident in because I train so hard so I believe that I'll beat anyone that's put in front of me I believe that I'll find a way to win but I never get complacent I never let what I've achieved get the better of me do you mm. know what I mean I just think it's interesting because like obviously when you get sort of medal success for example or you you know you win in tournaments in any at, at such a young age I try to compare it back to football just because it's my own life it, it's so easy to like think oh, I'm the man Do you yeah. know what I mean? I'm like I'm going here I'm going to be this like, we all seen it growing up it's, especially it's, when people are maybe then talking about you as well like, have you seen this new kid yeah. coming off the gym and you know Do you know what it's, it's great like obviously it's it's great to hear people talking about you and, and it's great for like within yourself just to know that oh, like, I'm doing unreal here like I'm I'm like for me I'm, I'm living my dreams you know what I mean everything that I've, I dreamt as, as a kid like I'm literally doing that and like being on TV and like I go I go out back home and people will be like oh like getting photos and ask me for photos and I'd never like not do that like get photos but I see myself as a regular person do you know what mm-hmm. I mean I always explain it as like people come up to me and be like oh you're famous and you're a celebrity I'm like I'm not I'm just somebody that does very very well at my job but it's in the public eye mm-hmm. like it's whatever you do if you're the best at sacking shelves you're the best at doing that but it's not in the public eye do you know what i mean mm. my job is i'm not out here to be famous or mm. be a celebrity i'm just someone that wants to be a world champion i don't care about the fame status but i understand that comes with the with being a boxer but yeah it's it's unreal to get like here um people say how oh, well you're doing and stuff but for me i could i, I would never let that kind of change who i am or mm. um or go, like get the better of me because i just feel like once you start doing that and it's like your real people know who you are do you know what I mean so yeah. I'm not somebody because ah, you see it so much nowadays like with social media and and it, I think you you have to kind of some people have to play a part in being fake to be successful um, and, and kind of I always get I would have thought you were stuck up from my social media but I've got to portray myself to be a certain not necessarily a certain person on, on social media but for my career to kind of build mm. my profile and stuff and I feel like this generation you kind of you get a lot of people that are fake because of the that fame mm. status mm. they have it is mad that I mean I always I've, I've told you this thing before there's a so Colby Covington in the UFC had to kind of do in terms of had to completely change his character you know for success mm. but I think it's such a mad concept isn't it of like yeah because people obviously like me watch the boxing they, they watch the fight but it's what goes around that like you have to be marketable, you have to be a exactly, good talk, you yeah. have to like mm. you have to be able to sell a show. And if you can't, you're just never gonna get you're just never gonna get opportunities. That's what pisses but, me off most though, yeah. about it. I mean, yeah, that's the thing, like especially in boxing now, mm. you got people like Jake Paul and mm. like for a play, listen, if if you're coming into sport to make money and whatever else, I'll never knock someone for, for trying to make a few quid. But it's just like he just He's not somebody who's skilled at, at what he's doing now. He's a, he's just somebody who can talk very well. So mm-hmm. he can sell a fight. Yeah. He, he can he can sell a fight, and people always say to me like, "When are you gonna start calling people? Like, when are you gonna do like trash talking and blah blah blah?" And I'm just like, "That's not me. Mm-hmm. I let my fist do the talking. Like I'm somebody that I don't need to talk at a press conference and hype up a fight. There will, there, will, there will come a time where I will have to, or I'll have to call for fights that I want. But it's just like I'll do my talking mm-hmm. in the ring. Do you know what I mean? I don't need to." 
Yeah, it's one thing I always used to say, like Callum Smith, like you yeah. know, know all the family well, and you know he's, he's my favourite fighter. And I used to think like he, he's never really, in my mind anyway, never really spoken about as much as he should be. Oh. And I just think like it's because he's so so, so quiet. quiet. <laughs> and I'm like, obviously he's being who he is, and it's you know he's a nice guy and that. But I just think like hmm. not so much the disrespect, but like there's just not enough respect on his name. Yeah. And it's just because like you're saying, he's just trying, he's just himself, and he doesn't feel the need to have to be yeah. fake, you know. Well, that's the thing. Like if you look at Callum, I mean he was on the uh, unified. Super middleweight champion on the on beating Fort Canelo, whatever else, and he's moved up to light heavyweight. Um, but outside the boxing world, nobody really knows him. Mm. But like, he's probably one of Britain's or the UK's most successful boxers over the last. Yeah. Um, a fan long. of all time, really. Yeah, it's like what he's achieved is mm. unbelievable. Do you know what I mean? And um, and it, it is sad that if you don't kind of have that personality to sell yourself mm. or like talk trash or whatever else you won't get the recogni- recognition that you mm-hmm. deserve but that's just to say the box yeah. do you think it's a fear of like obviously we'll go we'll jump, we're jumping ahead but we'll jump back into to your life now do you think it's a fear of not making money that in terms of like some because obviously you know there's, there's a disparity in boxing between people who earn a lot of money and people who earn nothing yeah do you think a lot of people it's like i've got to, if i don't make myself relevant doing this i'm not going to earn any money because i try to put myself in that position and i do think you know, it, it, it whether we like it or not, loud mouths get fed, don't they? And, yeah. Do you know what I mean? The, it does work. Mm. It, it's a blueprint well, that, of if you had an idiot. That's always a quote that I say, closed mouths don't that's get it, fed. Sir, yeah. yeah, closed mouths don't get fed. And But there's for me, there's a way of, of going about it. Do you know what I mean? Like, whenever I, the, the, there will come a time where I'll have to call someone or I'll have to sell a fed. But I can, you can do that respectfully. You yeah. don't have to go out and disrespect somebody or talk trash or whatever else. But I do think... For me, I always see it as people don't really believe in their own hype, so they have to mm-hmm. they have to talk about it. For me, there's no hype required. Like my performance and show how good I am as a fighter, and mm-hmm. um, I think people don't believe in themselves as much as they say they do. So they have to talk because mm-hmm. they're not confident in proving that in the ring. And whether they win or lose, it's always exciting to see them in the ring because you, you're gonna get that press conference or the social mm-hmm. media back and forth and. Do you know what I mean? It like it put it, it gets the views. Do you know what I mean? Like it's like people McGregor. He'd not be the person I was he is. Literally just gonna mention him then. Yeah. He'd not be the person he is without that kind of trash talking that that he he was able to build from his, the early on in his career. And he he had to do that to be that that mm. star. Do you know what I mean? And but then you get fighters like Anthony Joshua, who's who's a star, but. He's, he doesn't trash like he doesn't talk trash but then you've got Tyson Fury he talks trash and mm. it obviously backs it up but you can do it in mm. ever disrespectful way or respectful mm. way do you know what I mean I think the only bad thing is when you see someone doing it and you can see that it's like they shouldn't it's not yeah, them like, it's not them they were yeah. trying to um, mm. uh, they've made it a bit of a joke now which was a really clever move but for a couple of years they really tried to get Joe Joyce to talk like oh. they were just constantly and all I was thinking at home is just like turn him into like this, like I don't know, the crazy man who doesn't do interviews or something. Do you know what I mean? Like, and then did you see the BT Sport yeah. advert that he done? And it was a bit like yeah, it yeah. was about him not being able I to do stuff. I think they now turned it round yeah. into a joke, which I th- actually think's a really clever move. Yeah. But for like, honestly, God, they would just constantly put a mic, and he couldn't do it. Mm. And you're just thinking, like, think outside the box a little bit. It's <laughs> crazy as well. Cause like I know, I know Joe. Like we yeah. used to have the same um, strength coach in, in London and be in the gym together and. Like speaking to him face to face, he's not like that. But you put a camera in his face, he just kind of freezes and doesn't know mm. what to say. And you get that with a lot of people. Do you yeah. know what I mean? They they just they can't do it. But they're great. Like Joe's an, an unbelievable fighter. Do you know what I mean? And but then again, he can't talk mm. in front of a mm. camera. I think I remember I was work. I was actually working the Bois vs Joyce press conference, and it was just a, it was a cat. <laughs> I, 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 I would have hated to have been there. <laughs> it's like two people that can't talk, can't sell a fight, like. Yeah. Oh. So I think part of my job, I was like, I, know, I was reporting on that, or I think doing it into someone, I was doing something anyway, and I remember like 10 minutes into the press conference, just going, just going, <laughs> just going like, like, not into the right to yeah. Dude, I think the boy was like, I'm going to smash you, yeah. and then Joyce was like, nah, I'm going to smash you. <laughs> like, oh, oh, like, um, playground, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. back and forth. But, but I put on a great fight, to be fair, yeah. so. But it's that age of like, because the, the social media and just getting that click, like what McGregor's, I think, arguably made it I know, I know trash talking went on in boxing and stuff but I think the past like six seven years McGregor and social media becoming what it, what it is 
he's kind of given the blueprint and he to like look if you want your little viral moments that are gonna get replayed and sell fights then that, that, yeah. that's how you do it isn't it yeah but don't I think like before that you had obviously like, way back you had Muhammad Ali who just mm. tries talking you you got your Floyd Mayers and then this generation you got your Conor McGregor's and if you look at the one thing it's common with all three yeah they can fight but they've become very successful because they're marketable in other things mm. you know what I mean not just boxing and um yeah, I think McGregor's left a blueprint there to if you if you can back it up, mm. talk trash mm. because it's it's gonna get you bigger paydays and get you seen more and do you know what I mean? And and it's all about getting views and putting bombs yeah. on seats at the end of the day. I think that's one one of the things with Floyd Mayweather Mayweather, it was like people hated what he spoke about in you know, the twenty four sevens when he had money on the table and like and all that stuff. But it was just constantly backed up. Like yeah. and they said there was no I think you can get away with it as long as you can you know, as you like yeah. you said before, let your fist do the talking at the same time. I mean, yeah. when there's a disparity between what you're saying and what, what you're, you're doing, doing you're, yeah. you're in a bit when of bond. You're someone who can talk trash and and you believe in yourself as well, and yeah. you can actually back it up. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's a win-win. Yeah. Before we jump back into your boxing career, have you ever up to now like named a round or anything said like you know I'm gonna drop them in? Um, <laughs> not to, no. My, do you know what my friends always and my family always ask me like what round are you gonna do then but <laughs> I don't I just like, want to do it <laughs> yeah I just like I'm just happy with getting the win but um, I always try and give a prediction on my fights and uh, and if you put money on it that's, that's <laughs> yeah. what you know don't be coming to me so like, for the money the but yeah because I always I always put like, say I'm gonna do it because just off my previous fights I always kind of base it on like so early on in my career, I, st- I stopped every like I stopped like three four opponents in the third round, and then later on when I st- started stepping up, it's become like the seventh seventh and ninth round that I that I stopped opponents in. So I always try and call around, but I wouldn't publicly go out there and say I'm going to do it yeah, in this yeah. round. Yeah. Mm. Maybe in, in the future I might, but not <laughs> not right now. So yeah, obviously now we're obviously speaking about your career, but your career very close was very close to not being a career, not being yeah. a life really, if you want to be honest about it. But so you were stabbed in the in the neck. How old was you then? Yeah, twenty five years ago now. Um, so, yeah, so I got stabbed down the centre of the face and neck. Yeah, um, I was just uh, I, I was back from a multi nation tournament in Paris. I was still amateur at the time, um, and I just won a gold medal. And I was out with my ex girlfriend, uh, at a nightclub, and we weren't even drinking because I I was meant to fight against America the week after, and we had left the club like maybe an hour hour and a half before it was it was closing, and went round to McDonald's and. Um, yeah, someone had threw like a McDonald's cup and it hit me and went all over my eggs. And we were standing like the queue was outside McDonald's, so it was so many people there. And I've kind of obviously been a fighter and just someone with a lot of pride. I've stepped down, but like, who threw that? Nobody said anything. I've asked someone I know, did they see who threw that? And it was like, them was over there. And I've looked over and there's like 30 of them. I'm like, fuck's sake. So I'm just somebody that maybe now I would be able to, but back then I was. I'm not somebody who can let things go that easily without confronting it. So I've went over and asked, like, what are you playing at? They've obviously said it wasn't them. And so I was like, people seen it. like, well, okay, what are you going to do about it? I was like, I'll smash you about it. And it was like, his fr- I remember his friend laughing and being like, no, you won't. I was like, I'm telling you, I'll smash every single one he's about now. And uh, and then my, or they were like, go. So I went to take my watch off and my jacket and then I've looked at the same my ex is taking her watching jacket off and I was like oh, f- I was literally with her a week that day mm. I was like fuck I can't put her through that so I was like use it donuts and I've walked away and then one of them's like they've started like showing racial abuse at me and then one of them's if I've ever been in a, in a fight in the street I'd rather have my, my back against the wall because I know I'm not getting hit from anybody else and I don't know for for some reason not on that on that night I've just I've been drawn out and one of them's come at me and then the rest of them are like behind me so like he's pushed me and went to punch me and I've just hit him and he's like stumbled back so as I've went to um, like go at him again I've never been dropped in a ring or in out in the street and I've just felt someone hit me with a bottle and I've just dropped instantly um, and I remember just thinking to myself if I stayed out and I'm dead like I'm getting my head kicked and so I just got up and chased him and then the only thing I can remember after that was I was on top of one of them and my ex has pulled me off him it's been like right that's enough and uh as she's pulled me off and spun me around she's like I've just seen her face drop she's like what the f**k's happened to your face and obviously being a fed I'm just like I say if I caught her bruise I'm like I'm alright like her brother worked in in the nightclub that we were in doing the door so I was like we, we go around the car because obviously I'm trying to fight and make sure she's not getting hit and um 
I've tried to run off and she's grabbed me again and like gave me a hug and was like came to your face in a really bad way and like I pushed her off me and was like go round her and as I've said that I've looked down on her and it's like she's covered in blood now and, like what the fuck's happened to you like why are you bleeding she just looked at me it's like it's not my blood and I've looked down I'm just covered in blood and I'm like oh for fuck's sake like obviously not knowing how bad it was um, but yeah, an inch lower and I'd have bled out in 12 seconds, so I, I count my blessings. Mate, that is such a mad life. So where yeah. was this, what city was this in? Belfast, yeah. Belfast. In Belfast, and it's crazy because you, you don't hear of stabbings happening in Belfast. Like, I mean, I say that and one of my, two of my friends have been stabbed and I've lost a friend um, who used to be a boxer, Eamon McGee, um, who yeah. fought and his, his son was stabbed to death. But Belfast is in a city that's, that's known for, for stabbings. Um, but yeah, it was it was obviously an unfortunate time. The like fact that. it's a, like, you know, the game of life is a, the ultimate game of fine margins, isn't it? But like yeah. an inch lower, and it's like tw- it's, it's not like someone would have said, you know, if it was an inch lower, you'd have like lost the movement in your face, or you like you would have bled out in twelve seconds. Exactly. Like, yeah. Like I don't know. I've, I always I always say someone must be watching over me um, on that on that day, and I've, I just I was i was very lucky, but um, obviously it's not nice getting stabbed but when you put in things into perspective and I'm like when I realised like I literally could have lost my life over an argument over a McDonald's drink, do you know what I mean? It's it's quite scary like So what was the what was the case then? Just obviously get you to hospital and then stitch stitches in your face. Yeah, just... so um <laughs> so I remember after she's told me this, I've still tried to run off and grab them and then someone's just grabbed me and I've like turned to see who it was and it was the police and um so they've obviously went to get their first aid kit and stuff and I'm like, listen, can you can you just let me go? I'll go home and put a plaster on it. And I remember the the cop laughing at me and being like, it's more than a, a plaster you're gonna need. And that's when I kind of realised, right, okay, this is quite bad. Um, and then yeah, so they brought an ambulance. And I remember sitting in the back of the ambulance, just being so embarrassed, just like I've been with this girl, like, well, obviously I've known her well, but with in a relationship a week, and I've just I felt violated. Do you know what I mean? I've just been stabbed, I've got a fame, whatever else. And yeah, so they, I just remember them rushing me to any. Um, and then, like there was like ten doctors around me, cutting my clothes off, putting stuff in my arms, and like one of the main doctors was like, "Right, I'm gonna take this." Like obviously they put like a big bandage around the cops. They were like, "We're gonna take this off." And as he's went to do it, like I'm lying there, and it's just like blood squirting in the ceiling. Fuck. Oh fuck's sake! I've I've just I've just fought. Then I was like, "I fucked my boxing career. Like I'm I'm not gonna ever be able to box again." And um, I remember him saying like, right, you're losing too much blood. We can't give you any anaesthetic. We're gonna have to get this closed now. And um, yeah, so as he's like, as he's got another doctor. So as they're pulling it back, one's having to quickly stitch it. So I did get like twenty stitches then just to close it. And then obviously I went like they give me my own room and stuff, and um, they were like calling for blood transfusions and stuff like that. And uh, they were like, right, there's a couple of people that need to go for surgery first, and then you you'll be on later on the day. And then I was like, right, that's no problem. So I couldn't eat anything, obviously. And um, I remember my face started swelling up and the uh, stitches started to break. So I couldn't open my mouth or speak. And I remember like calling, I think it was my brother and my sister over and saying like, what's happening? And they were like, yeah, this is opening up. So I had the buzzer, doctor came in and was like, right, okay, we need to get you into surgery now. And I yeah, just had to get, I think it was like 50, 60 stitches or something like that. So, yeah. Mate, it's such a life. Fuck thing. me, man. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's stomach is square, man. Yeah. <laughs> For someone who's had injuries, had, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, no, you just... Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what? It was <laughs> It was weird because I felt okay throughout the whole thing. I, I wasn't in any pain. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, I've got a, like, my ex and, like, my friends who were there. Like, there was certain people there that knew me and, and stuff like that. I remember when, it, like, the cops stopped me they were standing there like they'd seen the inside of my face do you know what I mean and th- obviously for them that's not great to see like but I'd never seen that and I wasn't in any pain so for me it was just I was fine do you mm. know what I mean like I, I was okay other than being in hospital and having to get surgery I was fine do you know what I mean it's like um, it's a traumatic incident that though and I mean I know you're you know out on the outside you're a, you're a tough guy you, you know you've been doing boxing for you know a good number of years yeah. at that point but when you do get put in that room or after surgery and stuff do you feel like what what I would feel in terms of like the fear and like what has happened to me? Yeah, do you know what? For, it kind of reality set in whenever, um, like the, everyone went home and I was lying in a hospital room on my own and I'm, do you know, I mean, you're there with your thoughts and obviously it was very early on, but I didn't know what was happening with my life and my career. I had to leave my job. I was out of boxing for six months and 
that period in, like in my life for the first year and a half like was a struggle for me like it mentally broke me I'd, I'd like I'd hit rock bottom and um I didn't know whether like to get revenge obviously someone who has a lot of pride and whatever else and do I go down the right road or do I go down the wrong road? Do I continue my boxing career? And yeah, it me- mentally broke me, and um, it was it was very mentally challenging to obviously get back to the to where I am now. But I'm thankful that I made the right decisions mm. and I, I had the right people around me to get me to where I am now. That's know. what I was thinking in my mm. mind, and because when you get attacked in that way, it must be very simple to go down the what you would call the wrong road in terms of like, you know, obviously that road is you know shake it off try and get back to box and start again but then it would be very easy to go I know how to defend myself if I can get my hands on this fella who done it I'll be able to yeah. you know get one back and I mean that decision in that moment's very pivotal isn't it yeah well I mean it was a decision that <laughs> kind of took a very long time to make and, and overcome but um, like I've got friends that wouldn't let that slide and like having to chat to them and being like right we're just going to leave this and um I want to be a successful fighter. I, I'm gonna kill them with success. Do you know what I mean? Mm. They're they're probably nobodies that are doing nothing with their life. I don't like. I don't know who who it was to stab me. I know who one or two of them that were involved, but I don't know who who exactly stabbed me. Um, nothing was ever done about it. It's crazy. Like the prosecution have never prosecuted anybody, and they're actually gonna do me for defending myself. Which is fucking what? insane. So no so one got done in the end. No one got done in the end. But because when I got hit with a bottle. Because I got up and chased him and didn't walk away, I'm not seen as an, an innocent party. Wow. Because you re- it's basically because in there, mind you, retaliated to the... Yeah, to but I think my, my point was, if I walk away, they're just going to attack me again. Okay. Yeah. So I have no uh, choice but to defend myself. But yeah, for me, it was like not getting any, ju- like, any justice. And mm. I didn't really care about like putting someone away but it was the fact that that person can do it to another person mm. and hard effect in my life it's going to affect that person's life as well maybe they'll kill somebody so that was the only reason why I was like maybe someone should be put away for it do you know what I mean but um, yeah obviously it was it's, it's not that long ago either really is it five years it five, isn't that no, long it's not listen I'll, I'll be lying if, if I said like it's not it doesn't still mentally affect me at times but I've came a, a very very long mm. way f- from where, where I was like do you know what I mean five years ago like I I literally for me I, I always explain it as like I hit rock bottom and I was in some dark dark places and not knowing obviously was I gonna box again and um, trying to get my career back because whenever I went back to boxing um, even four four months later three four months later because um, I'd lost so much blood it takes a while for it all to obviously go back mm. to normal like I was getting lightheaded and felt fainty and do you know what I mean I was putting on a lot of weight and I had to leave my job so I wasn't working anymore because where I worked I worked in town so see the city tours like the red buses I worked uh-huh. I worked for one of them and back home um, you tour guide yeah yeah I was a tour guide <laughs> back home just I used to I used to be a plumber That's and then great. I used to be a plumber and then because of boxing I, I couldn't commit everything to boxing so I had to leave to a job that was more flexible and um yeah, so I worked in town. So where I worked and had to stand to sell tickets was literally a, a minute walk from where I got stabbed. Mm. So I had to leave yeah. my job and I, and stuff like that. So yeah, it was, it was one of the months where I didn't know what was going on in my life. And obviously then things started getting very, very tough for me, like suicidal thoughts and whatever else. And then I'd just go get professional help. So Fair play to you, by the way. That's a yeah. you know, mm. brave move to make. But when, you're, um, when you are like rehabbing, do, is there the doubts of I mean you might be able to obviously come in on this as well but is there the doubts of am I going to be able to am I going to be the same fighter am I going to be able you know yeah is that is that version of me gone yeah I think I, I definitely lost confidence um, but for me it was getting back in the ring straight away and not and kind of because obviously I just come off winning a, a goal in a, in a very very tough tournament and then I got stabbed and then I, five months later I had went to another tournament and there was a lot of like media work done behind it and stuff like that and it's like for me if I lose people are going to portray me as not being the same fighter I've just come off winning probably the biggest tournament of my career to then get beaten in a tournament that I should win and is it because I got stabbed am I not the same fighter and for me I needed to prove not not to anybody else prove to myself that that I still was that fighter but I did lose a lot of confidence and obviously I've got a scar on my face so like I'm thinking is this going to open up and, and 
sparring or in a, in a fight and, and whatnot and there's a lot of things that I, I had to overcome you know me- mentally as well you say um, was that a tough decision I know it's mental health spoken about a lot more now than it was but it's still got that taboo was it tough to kind of think right I need to go and speak to someone now it was do you know what I'm I'm somebody that I don't tell anyone my problems I don't I deal with it all myself and whether that's right or wrong I, I know that I, I, I'm capable of dealing with myself but at that time in my life I couldn't because I was having suicidal thoughts and um, if things were getting very tough for me but thankfully I had the right support I had friends, family, but it got to a stage where I was obviously still with my ex and she had seen it was affecting me and she was like, you're going to have to speak to somebody, you're going to have to speak to me at least, like you, you need to open up. And thankfully I spoke to her and then um, I went and got uh, professional help. And it, w- it was very tough because you're literally, you're telling somebody that you don't know your problems and you're expecting them to fix all these problems. Um, but for me, it was probably the best thing that I've ever done and I feel like it saved my life because um, see as a man you never want to speak to anybody and you feel like oh I've got too much pride or ego and I don't need anybody's help and um, when I went and I see sat and had that first session it was like a relief because even though I didn't know the person it was like getting it off my chest and being able mm. to speak to somebody and and hearing their ideas of how this is how what their ideas of um the road to getting better and, and fixing things so um, yeah if, I mean I definitely think that was the, one of the best decisions I've mm. ever made in my life and uh, speaking to somebody and, and getting professional help and I, I can't kind of um, advise that anymore to anybody that's going through mental health issues that literally speaking to anybody speaking to your friends your family whether it's a stranger um, or going and getting professional help it, it does help it's so hard isn't it that like it's just the initial conversation we've spoken about this yeah. on the podcast before it's like because we all have thoughts. No, I think yeah. as men, we can probably understand that. Like life stresses, you know, doubts, whatever it might be. It's just getting them words out your mouth, though, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Of like, mate, I don't really know how to solve yeah. this. And like, but that's such a, I, I guess, you know, I've never thankfully ever been in a position where I really need to. But I guess once you get that out, the rest then naturally follows, doesn't it? In terms yeah. of when you realise it's okay that people aren't going to sit mm-hmm. there and judge it or call that's you weak thing. or it's whatever. It's like the judging the ego, so... I told you this like off air but uh, I went to see a counsellor probably about six weeks ago first time I uh, just been feeling really low and I thought about it in the past but what what stopped me for a long time was like my ego not that I'm anyone but I was thinking so my job as a motivational speaker going around trying to inspire and motivate people I'm thinking I can't come and sit to you and tell you that yeah. I feel like my life's a mess when on the outside I'm like this motivational speaker and I thought like my ego stopped me for so long going to see someone but then when I finally did, and I'm sitting there, like you say, talking to a stranger, explaining your situation, I come out of there, felt like the weight of the world had been lifted. Yeah, you know? exactly. And that was the same for me. And like, the thing is, people don't realise it is okay not to, to be okay. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And um, once you get past that point of kind of putting your pride and your ego to the side and mm-hmm. realise that you're actually doing it to benefit your life, you're, you're getting help to benefit you it's, it's in the long run. Do you know what I mean? I, yeah, like telling people your problems and whatever else you, you're you're thinking, like, how are they gonna help me or they've got so much on on. Like, the first step for me was speaking to my ex girlfriend. You know what I mean? And I didn't want to put that weight of my problems on her mm-hmm. shoulders. And um, but when I did and and told her how, how I felt or um, what was going on in my mind, it was easier for her to communicate with me and and. Um, judge things and then go on and get professional help. Do you know what I mean? It was that's the that's the first step to to better on yourself and mm. better on your life. I think the the thing people don't understand is that it's actually the, one of the strongest decisions you can make. Yeah. Whereas the perception of it, like internally, is I can't put, I can't be weak. I can't like mm. yeah. you know. I, I get I bet everyone else has got these problems, but it's actually like as a man owning up to something is actually a really strong move, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of like, and I just think that's that's the little grey area that I think people struggle with yeah and I think like as a man as well like I think we're very hypocritical because we advise all this but then wouldn't do it ourselves Mm -hmm. do you know what I mean and sometimes you've got to take your own advice and and, do you know what I mean and go and speak to people and so I mean like I remember for a very long time I was somebody that would never tell anybody my problems nobody knew what was going on in my mind and or in my life or how down I was feeling but I'd be there for my friends and I would give them advice and I'd 
tell them to go speak to people or if you ever need me for anything you can speak to me but inside I'm dying do you know what I mean mm. and then once I actually spoke to somebody and realised was like she was on the other foot it bettered me as a person it bettered my life and it was the best decision I made mm. do you know what I mean so powerful that something um, obviously something so bad happening to you as almost like you know definitely now but I mean even just that whole the ball that that started rolling from it's really helped you in terms of you know I'm sure you come out the other side of that the council and stuff as a much stronger yeah better it's person. crazy because I'm always someone who's been mentally strong um, and believe in myself but it's it's not something that I wanted to happen I didn't want to get stabbed but getting stabbed without doubt has made me a better person it's changed my life so much um, I see things differently um, it's made me a better fighter without doubt and yeah it's maybe a harsh reality that I that I had to face but it, it's bettered me as a person and bettered my life without doubt and it's crazy to say like I had to get stabbed to mm. kind of change things or, or become a better person but I always try and look at the positives in, in, in certain situations and that was kind of one of the things I remember being in the hospital and uh one of my friends I'm not too sure if you know he's like a worldwide DJ Colin Francis and uh, he's from Essex and he texted me a nice message and he had said look at someone like 50 cent he'd been shot nine times but he stayed positive and he was still successful and that always stuck with me no matter what you've gone through no matter what mm. if you're on the road to to trying to be successful you're on a, on a path to um, trying to do great things you're going to face obstacles that are going to try and take you off that path and as long as you, you're mentally strong enough and you know what you want you'll be successful do you know what I mean so yeah um yeah, it's mad. Getting stabbed has bettered me as a person, but um, it was a harsh reality. But it was is, is something that kind of I'm thankful for as well. You're saying it, it bettered you as a person. I mean, you weren't doing too bad boxing wise. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, so that boxing career, then you know, you kind of have the 14, 14, 15. You know, you do you do really well. Those next kind of few years, and you end up winning a tournament. You said that twenty. I mean. So you're working again like part time, getting by type thing, but your boxing career is just going from strength to strength then I guess. Yeah, I mean, I was very successful amateur up until um senior, so my youth junior and youth I was very successful, won all the nationals and then I won a na or I won a also elite title title at just eighteen and which was massive for me and then it kinda went stale for a while. I just couldn't break through the the um kinda the Irish elites, which is the seniors, and like to get onto the Olympic team, I was beaten in three semi-finals um, on a split decision. I just didn't. I don't know why. I didn't know what was wrong. Or I knew I had the talent. I knew I was better than these fighters, and I just kept. I just kept losing on the split decisions. Um, but the thing for me, I think, was staying consistent and not letting a defeat kind of um, get to me or, or change anything. Because you see a lot of fighters that are very good as, as like youth and juniors and they get the senior level and at, when you're fighting from 18 to like men at 30 40 years old it's it's completely different um and they take it to feet and then they give boxing up but for me I, I stay consistent and then at 21 i won i finally won a, an RS elite um and then that year was kind of my break for a year to to turn in professional i won that i represented Ireland against usa out in boston and then i off of that I got picked for a thing that's called WSB yeah. World Series of Boxing and I fought for the Italian funders which was over like a five round format um, and then yeah then I obviously had Frank Warren come knocking and, and offer me a contract Was you always like did you have an eye because obviously as an amateur everything's like centred around the Olympics essentially yeah. isn't it? but I mean I know it's a, a rugged like selection process and sort of teams and stuff did you have an eye sort of when you hit like 20 of I want to be a professional yeah, from 14 I knew I wanted to be oh, professional, okay. so my, the end goal was always to be a professional and be a, a world champion, but obviously you get, you have to go through stages to get to that level, and for me in the amateurs it was going to the Olympics, come off games, representing Ireland at the at the highest that I possibly could, and I achieved everything in Irish boxing from junior level to senior level, and I represented my country and stuff, but I feel like I failed in not representing Ireland at, at the Olympics, but I think I, back then I had a very tough weight division and it was very hard and I was still young and um, I'd kind of give myself a two-year plan so I didn't qualify for, for Rio and then I'd give myself a two-year plan I said if I make the come off games um, 
so that was my next goal the, the 2018 come off games in Gold Coast I'll uh, whether I, I win or, or whether I go to come off games or I don't I'm turning pro before or after um, and unfortunately I didn't I kind of threw it away there's I've, I've, I don't know if you know Stephen Donnelly yeah. um, Stephen Donnelly he uh, obviously went to the Olympics and three come off games he beat me on a split decision um, in, the, in the qualifiers um, I kind of threw that fight away myself I got a public warning um, but yeah so he beat me and then I yeah it was for me I was I was turning pro but thankfully my, my amateur coach pleaded with me to, to stay amateur um, and he pleaded with me to fight one more kind of arse elites and I, and I did and um, thankfully I won them because that for what I did that's my biggest achievement to date is winning the arse elites um, and then obviously I went on to turn pro what is the because I'm always interested in this what is the transition like from like I know people talk about in the ring it's like different because obviously you need to be able to punch and all that stuff but when you then so you're on like the Irish team and you're surrounded by your amateur coach and stuff what's it like when like a promoter comes with a contract and then you've got to like weigh that up you've got to find a a coaching team you've got to decide whether you want to stay in Belfast or go elsewhere like because it essentially is a different sport isn't it yeah is that intimidating you're like an agent as well yeah so you've got managers and stuff mm. like that yeah um it's a different sport like you say it's everything's completely different um obviously you you've got to get sponsors you've got to get um like a, a manager uh coaches promotional team you're doing like interviews constantly and it's completely different so transitioning over from the the amateurs to the pros is it's, it's it is tough um because you there's a lot of decisions on to be made um especially like i made the decision to to move away from from belfast i just felt um like that would benefit me in the long run and what I wanted to achieve and uh, taking me out of my comfort zone was one of the best things but it is it's different because you don't know you're, you're moving into this new set of boxing where professional boxing is a ruthless sport mm. it's everyone sees the the kind of the, the bright lights and TV and whatever else and it's far from it like it's far from the best thing ever because you don't know who to trust do you know what I mean you don't know who's good for you and who's not and you got you either don't trust anybody or you learn the hard way so um, yeah it's it's very it's very tough moving from the amateurs to the pros and obviously transitioning you've got to change your style completely mm. um, so I mean amateur is kind of fast paced it's only three three minute rounds um, as where professional is over minimum four um, right up to twelve, so it's a, it's a lot different. That um that transition like in the ring, just like <clears throat> as a massive boxing fan, someone who's trying to be around it, that does like intrigue me so much because like, you know, we had a fighter in Liverpool called Tom Stoker, who was um you know yeah. captain of yeah. Team GB, and then he turned pro with Eddie Earn, and it just didn't work. And it's like Frankie Gavin, I know Frankie Gavin fought for a world title and stuff, but again, he was like you know one of the best amateurs you could ever watch, and then it just wasn't the same and is that something you're consciously aware of or is it like do you um, just think I'll be fine in the pros like I mean well I've always even in the amateur I always had that professional style everyone mm. always used to say you're going to be a, a good pro just because I was always aggressive and could punch hard and if you can punch hard you'll do well in the pros um, but obviously if you're technically good then you're going to go f- further but um, yeah you, I mean you, you had like the likes of Paddy Barnes for Ireland as well who mm. was an unbelievable amateur but just did, couldn't do anything in the pros and I think when you look at the Tom Stalkers the Frankie Gavins and and stuff like that for me it was they stayed they stayed around the amateur scene for too long mm. like Paddy Barnes didn't turn he's like 31 wasn't yeah, he yeah didn't turn really? professional yeah. Yeah. 30, 31 understandably because of his weight yeah there wasn't a lot of money in it and he was getting paid um, by the the Irish institution um, sports institution so obviously it was one of the months where he was making money as as an amateur so he didn't need to turn pro and he went to free Olympics but if I would say if he if he turned pro a lot earlier he'd been able to transition his style into a professional boxer as where he was so used to amateur boxing that it just didn't work out and mm-hmm. same as, as Tom Stalker you have to move so quick don't you in them lighter weight divisions because yeah. I think Paddy Barnes <laughs> I think he had a fight on Conlon's undercard at like Madison Square Garden or something, and he was probably put in with someone as a pro that made it was a bit too early, and then I think he got a cut or he got beat or yeah. something. But in them weight divisions, it's especially brutal because the depth just isn't the depth just isn't there. Like yeah. you don't well, have the natural progression through the. When well, you're coming off a, a good amateur background like him, himself or someone that's been to two or three Olympics or even one, mm. even now, like you you you're 
expected to move a lot faster than just your average pro that's, that's turning over on an average amateur background do you know what i mean because they fought at the highest level in amateur boxing they f- they faced every every style um so they should probably move a bit quicker mm-hmm. when you're obviously a, you know an elite amateur then when you turn over in was it 2018 was it 20 yeah. yeah when you then go and fight journeyman who i've got crazy respect for i don't think there's i actually don't think there's that big that many of them these days anyway um but what's that like because you know you go from fighting people who coming at you with ambition you know we're both elite amateurs i'm looking to beat you you're looking to beat me to that like i'm here to survive if yeah. you can break me down then good luck to you well do you know what? it's 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 tough because it's hard to look good against a journeyman because mm-hmm. their job is to survive that's how they get paid they get paid because they can fight week in week out do you know what i mean you see during like my first journeyman had um, like 70, 80 fights do you know what I mean so it's yeah, 11, 52 and 9 he was yeah <laughs> that's a lot I mean? of so fights like, they their the job is to, to survive so they, they can fight the week after so they basically just run or they they cover up and mm. you can't stop them you can't knock them out so um, it's tough because you can't really show for me I'm a better fighter when someone comes to fight because I can um like I can look for openings and, and stuff like that as we're fighting against a journeyman and they're, they're trying to cover up and survive it, it's hard so transitioning from to an amateur like where it's so competitive um, to them fighting journeyman at the start of your career it, it's tough it's different mm-hmm. it's a it's a weird feeling because you're expected to win as well mm-hmm. so it's like you're not really getting praised for it do you know what I mean even though like you're in a, you're a professional boxer and you're beating beating somebody you're not really getting any mm-hmm. any praise because you're expected to win I think we seen that in real terms the other day I was speaking to you earlier off air about being at the, uh, the boxer show the other week mm-hmm. our friend Paddy Lacey fought a guy who'd never been stopped I think he'd done 36 defeats I didn't mean stopped a single time and um, but obviously you have five hundred people there, and people who don't understand boxing, so to speak, to be like, oh, this fellow hasn't, he's won one, I think. Yeah, Paddy will steam right him through him. Up, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you don't, but that's almost in itself a pressure, isn't it? Because oh. I guess when you're selling tickets, you're like, I have got to like, you know, everyone wants the knockout, mm-hmm. everyone wants this viral moment of he's a beast. But I get the reality is very different, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Like people, you see people, or you see journeyman that's that's never been stopped and then you get a pro maybe he's two three and oh four and oh and you're like looking at him like yeah he'll he'll steam roll him and walk through him but that journeyman's job is not to get stopped so that he can fight next week do you know what i mean so it's it's he's journeymen are like the craftiest fighters ever they they just know how to survive mm. um and no matter what like i've seen some you look at some of the best talents that's world champions like even like someone like Callum Smith, I remember because I remember I didn't stop my first two two uh, opponents, and then stopped my third, didn't stop my fourth, and then I went on like a six KO run or a six or seven KO run. But I remember at the start of my career, I was looking at I actually looked at Callum Smith's um, record and was like, Callum didn't stop his first two three opponents, and then he didn't stop a couple on, and then as he moved up the levels, obviously mm. he's knocking everybody out. He's one of the mm. biggest punchers yeah. in boxing at the moment, but it's because he didn't stop them because they didn't want to be stopped do you know what I mean yeah. it's because that's their job to survive I, th- I remember watching mm. Callum's early career I mean Callum went on this crazy thing of knocking everyone out in the first round in like British <laughs> European <laughs> level but he, um, I remember and he, you could literally see the frustration on his face of like I'm hitting you here with like shock yeah. like why aren't you why are you still yeah. there but then when people started I mean his catch like counter Cal- <laughs> fucking he's got the best <laughs> as he said to uh, uh, Beefy last week or two weeks ago I think it was he was sparring and we were watching Callum spar just before he fought, and I said, "Who's got a better catch count there?" And he was like, "Oh, him, without without mm. doubt, his and mine's just good, but his just comes so naturally. Mm. It's just like second nature to him." I think the Groves one for me is the oh, perfect mm. one because Groves like was a tough fellow, on he like he took some yeah. big shots. Groves like I know he got knocked out by Frotch and stuff, but it was just like the it's like he doesn't think about it. Yeah. It's like he just he feels something with his gloves and then he just literally because it's, it's so hard to do. Yeah, like, a, a catch count there is so hard to do and. Um, he just makes it look so easy. Yeah. He's it's got how a- fast and how, how fast you can go from catching and then boom, it's gone. It's mm. like, yeah. wow. I mean, he's got a highlight reel of the same shot. He actually, I, he got Rock- left hook. Yeah, yeah, he got Rocky with one. He didn't knock, knock Rocky out with the single shot, but it's pretty yeah. much what started it. Luke Blackledge, which is like the one oh. that goes, it's just mm. frightening. And then I think obviously he got Groves and he got this guy the other day. Yeah. It's just, it's he just, got the one against Hassan. Uh, yeah, yeah. For, like yeah. That, that Madison Square Garden, that's just... 
But I think he got the guy. Um, I forget his name. He won for the European title at the Echo Arena as well. I was at it. Was Mohammed, at it. was it? Yeah. He got him with the exact same oh, thing. Yeah, I, I was scared watching that. I was ringside for that mate, and I felt a bit like, ah, oh, that's scary. That man. I don't remember <laughs> yeah, yeah. watching a scary movie, or something. I was like, oh man, that's. <laughs> We take obviously back to your career, like going through. You obviously have all. So the before on your career, what's I went to ask before when you said when you signed with Frank Warren, what's what's that kind of like signing your first pro and stuff? I mean, with the other offers on the table, did you want to go with him? Does he? I mean, how does that whole signing yeah, the, pro? Um, yeah, there was other offers on the table, and I was out. So it was it was great for me because most pros, unless you've got an, a standout amateur background. You don't get sent by a promoter. You've kind of your first five to ten fights. You've got to prove yourself to for a promoter to then come and sign you. And um, for me, for Frank, one and the same. It was unbelievable. And there was talks about Eddie sending me. And obviously now I'm with Eddie. It, whenever I say him with him, he he, he says um, that he he had the opportunity to send me and he turned it down because I was a bit of a unknown quantity. And and then he seen me fight and was like, "Fuck, I made a big mistake here." <laughs> um, and then obviously it's come back. F- full circle now I'm, I'm with him but yeah it was it was great for me because there's not a lot of fighters in in Belfast that get that opportunity at the start of their career I mean Carl Frampton and, and I, I think Carl Frampton is probably one of the only ones uh, mm-hmm. even like Ram Burnett at the start of his career wasn't with Eddie he was just same with um with Hatton do you know what I mean yeah. so for me it was like I stood out from everybody else I'm, I'm a fighter that has done it the hard way and thankfully I got the recognition at the start of my, my pro career. I was signed by one of the one of the best uh, and a, a obviously a hall of famer promoter. Um, so yeah, it was it was great, and it, I knew that I would get the opportunities that I deserved to kind of perform on the big stage. I think it was um, it was the Jez Smith fight, wasn't it? That yeah. was the one that because I, I actually remember watching it, and I'd um, obviously just being inside the head about you and stuff like that. So I was trying to like pass it off as my own, telling everyone to bet on you. Yeah. But, like, like, it was that I think that was the fight because I remember social media in that fight going like people were like this was like Mike Tyson. Yeah, <laughs> I think in the in the pros that's been my standout performance. Um, yeah, that was a, it was yeah. a good fight. And obviously, it was during lockdown, so everybody was kind of watching. There was nothing else to do. Yeah. <laughs> so um, watching them betting that was yeah. literally my life. And my, my brother actually had money on round nine. I yeah. don't know how he picked round nine because <laughs> I actually thought I would have got Jez out of there mm. earlier because he's he was stepping up to middleweight from welterweight. Um, he's, he's tough, but yeah, yeah uh, it was one. Of, it was a great fight, obviously, and it was one of the ones that kind of gave me the recognition mm. that I that I feel like I deserved and. Um, it was a great performance for me. I think after that, I always remember um, just being on Twitter and stuff. In every time Matchroom or Eddie posted, or he was like a live Instagram, your name was always like, "You yeah. need to sign him. You need to sign him." Yeah. And it was like it was sort of like it wasn't disrespectful to Frank Warren, but I think the way like the British public at the time, um, Eddie was obviously getting a disown deal and stuff. It was almost it does feel a bit like you know Frank Warren and then you know the real elite fighters will maybe go to Eddie and I think you just on that up on the back of that fight literally when you obviously got that win did that open up doors in terms of obviously moving to Eddie and just the fact that um, you were getting more attention yeah I started getting more attention but it was weird because I still I still had a year left in my contract with with Frank um but Frank wasn't giving me the opportunities that I felt like I deserved he wasn't putting me on the he wasn't promote me in the way that Eddie certainly is is now so um, obviously to the boxing world it was a great performance and it kind of got my name out there and like I was getting fans from America and all over the world and whatever else and but then again it was like my promoter still didn't believe in me for some for whatever reason or didn't want to promote me the way he was promoting your, your Dubois and your Dennis McCann's and Hamza Siraz and stuff like that and um, thankfully then when my contract was up with him I had the opportunity I had a couple of deals on the table and for me it was a no brainer to, to go with Eddie because I knew he would promote me right and that he believed in um, in making me a world champion I think we, we again we said we having a chat off here and we've said it on the sports show loads Eddie gets a lot of stick and sometimes I'm not going to lie I think some some of the things he says or does or whatever he's open to stick so that's fine but as a promoter I'm just not sure there's anyone better in mm-hmm. the game because as you say he sees talent He's honest enough to say, you know, when he passed up on the chance to sign you that, you know, he didn't want to take a chance or whatever. But then when once he does get you in, there's not really someone who's going to push you on a platform the way he does. I mean, when you signed, there was about a 15 minute documentary about yeah. your journey and, you know, stuff like that. It's them little things that I think he understands better than 
you know, certainly yeah. in, in Britain, but now on a global scale. When you um, obviously sign with him, is is your is your path mapped out at that level? Is it is he sort of saying, no, I'm going to make you the world champion, or is it on you to go? He, does he go like I've give you the platform? Go and show everyone that you can be a world champion. Yeah, I mean, at the start, obviously, I was still I was only nine and zero signing with him, so I'm still com- in that kind of prospect bracket. Um, but thankfully, I I had signed with a new manager just before I signed with Eddie, um, Paul Reddy and STN, yeah. and that's probably the best move I've made in my, my professional career to date. Um, but obviously, he it's his job to do, to go and get me the best deal pro- possible of whoever it may be. And thankfully, Matrim came knocking and. Um, when when he was sitting down to have negotiations with Matram, obviously they're planning out whatever deal it is and what the the right steps were. So um, yeah, I mean, although Eddie believes I'm going to be a world champion, he's given me the platform, and it's it's on me to to go out there and and move through the ranks and and um, prove that to everybody. Your first fight was here, wasn't it, Liverpool? Liverpool, yeah. yeah. The first fight was in in uh, there on a spank, echo, <laughs> um, on Kitty Taylor, Conor Ben on the card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was unreal. When you come to Liverpool, did you have a, an awareness of Liverpool, sort of anyway, or was it sort of that was your first time sort of boxing there? It was my first time boxing there, yeah. but I'd been on a couple of nights. So I knew it was a great city. Do yeah. you know what I mean? What's it like, sort of? Just I'm just trying to live vicariously through you. <laughs> What's it like boxing at like? Oh, that? Was, do you know what? It, it was a it's the closest thing to boxing back home because yeah. it's so similar. But yeah, I mean, I think boxing in Liverpool. Um, it's been probably one of my favourites. Um, obviously, it was a, it was my first title fight, uh, my first fight with Matchroom, and I was fighting on on beating Fedor and stuff like that. And then to fight fight in Liverpool, which is such a fighting city, it was just it was unbelievable for me. And it was like a lot of people knew me for some reason, like in Liverpool, and like just even just walking down the street, it was just like back home, just people, what's happening? You're right. Um, best of luck tonight and stuff like that so it was, it was an amazing experience yeah, for me I think in Liverpool if you've made any sort of inroad in boxing people know you I mean yeah. remember there was a guy well, he's a world champion but wouldn't be known to the the normal boxing head person this guy called Zolani Tete he was yeah. like he, uh, he fought on Frank Warren cards in, um, and he had this thing called like the Scout African but like, <laughs> literally I was on I was obviously working the show and I was on the dock on the Albert dock and literally people were like crowding around him and you could even see him like what is going on? Yeah, I know he yeah. beat Paul Butler and stuff, but it was sort of that thing like in Liverpool with like football and boxing and now MMA. If you have got talent, the like yeah, a lot of people yeah. in the city will notice it and will try and get behind you. Yeah, and they appreciate that. Like, you know, what I mean, they they know talent when they see it and yeah. they, they like to support and, and get behind you and um and follow your career and stuff. And that's like I've had so many since fight just fight in Liverpool. I've had so much support from from the people in the city and now that I'm I'm. I feel like I'm a part of the city now and mm-hmm. obviously representing Liverpool, representing Rotunda and, and Joe McNally's gym and um, the people have just been great and supporting me and getting, getting behind and following my career. Talking about Joe, so your first two fights with Eddie were at middleweight yeah. under your, your form team, which is iBox was yeah. in, in London. What was the decision to, one, move gyms, two, move to Liverpool and also to move down to 154? Um, yeah, so... I wasn't so first of on moving gyms. I just wasn't happy in London. I wasn't happy in the gym. Um, I felt like I'd stopped learning. I'm somebody like I know how good I am, but like I said, I never let that get the better of me. I'm I'm chasing perfection. I'm chasing them one percent to be a better fighter, be a better person every day. And um, once you stop learning and improving, you need to make a change, or I'm not going to achieve anything. Um, and I felt like I'd seen slight dips in my performances and whether that was because I was unhappy or whether it was just as the obsession of getting better, I haven't improved. Um, but yeah, so I'd, I'd made, the, after my last fight, or my last camp, I'd made the decision to obviously change change trainers. Um, on moving down weight, uh, after the fight in Nottingham, um, Eddie and my former coach had just said to me after the fight, why don't we um, try and make 154? Just because... I was making 160 middleweight very comfortably um, and it was like there's, you're getting fighters coming down from like light heavy or heavier so they have the advantage they're massive they're, they're always bigger I mean maybe not physically bigger but they're always taller than me so they've got an advantage and if I could make light middle comfortably or make it um, healthily then 
I, I would then have the advantage. Um, so yeah, we, we employed a, a new nutritionist and he ran the numbers and thankfully I, I could make it. And I, I actually made it in my last fight easier than I've ever made middleweight, which is mad. Um, but yeah, and then obviously moving to, to Liverpool. Uh, so my, my manager's obviously, he's got a good relationship with, with uh, the lads in the gym and Joe and stuff. And after my fight, I told him that I wanted to move gyms and and stuff like that and who would he suggest that would suit me stylistically and I, I knew that I didn't want to train in London anymore um, although I, I was kind of not happy in the gym I wasn't happy in London so and I felt like I needed to change and yeah he suggested um, Joe and, and another, another coach and for me it was Joe was the first on the list to kind of come and try and see what he had done with Beefy in terms of I felt like I feel like Beefy's improved under him I feel like yeah. JJ Metcalf has improved under him and um, I've heard great things about Joe and Declan so I uh, yeah I, I contacted Joe and asked him I told him about like I was leaving my gym and um, could I come down and train and he said yeah and um, thankfully we, we hit it off and gelled straight away and I didn't need to go try anywhere else What's that like is it sort of the first day at school thing because you know the Rotunda is obviously a famous gym in the city you know people in boxing know it as well but when you come to Liverpool and you is it sort of that like right I'm going through these doors I've got to prove myself all over again got to make sure yeah. he likes me got to you know make sure he thinks I've got ability is, is it like that? Um, for me it wasn't because Joe knew how good I am and he's, he's like he said before like he's been a fan of my fighting style and um, obviously he knows that I've got talent and whatnot. so it was more so I've got to be coachable do you know what I mean? I've I, I know how jo, how good Joe is as a coach, and um, thankfully, like I said, we 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 hit it off straight away and gel our, our styles gelled together, and um, yeah, of course you you kind of especially with obviously you got Beefy and and JJ in the gym that's the the, the same way as me, so you'd think that I would probably go in with the mentality of like I want to prove myself as the the best one fifty four in the gym, but it, I didn't really have that. I was just just if he thinks I'm good enough and he, he thinks like he can bring me to the next level then then so be it but um, yeah we, we gelled and um, thankfully uh, I didn't have to go and look, look anywhere else it's the perfect learning opportunity I guess and obviously Liam as you say I think yeah. he's probably in the form of his career um, he's you know been the best 154 pound in Britain for a long time JJ Metcalf's been around for years but his last performance on the yeah. show was probably the best, best of his career yeah. so I guess away from the competitiveness it's probably like you know, he's got a track record of people in your division with a similar style to yours, not not yeah. I- identical, but similar. And like, I guess that breeds confidence into you to think, you know, you can have yeah, the same positive impact definitely. on and, me. And Joe himself was a great great fighter mm. and he fought in middleweight, late middle as well. So he was in that weight class. And yeah, I think obviously you see what he's done with, with the two lads. And um, Joe's got an un- unbelievable boxing brain and IQ. Mm. And he, he, the way he breaks things down and explains things, it just makes sense. And um yeah, it's it's. I've got a lot of comp like having someone like Joe in your corner. You you have confidence in him imp- improving you, and whether you're in a spa or in a fight, he's gonna give you the right tactics. And you believe in that, then it, you'll get the win. Do you know what I mean? He's gonna tell you as well. I mean, I yeah, guess he's, he's, like, he's, <laughs> he's not gonna. He doesn't beat around the bush. He's gonna <laughs> tell you straight. How does it work with obviously Declan's there as well? How does it work with, like the two of them working together? Yeah, so obviously Joe. I think Joe's the main coach. He's the number one. Dex, Dex the number two. So, yeah, they they they're a great team. They work mm. together very well, and um, yeah, they obviously plan out the sessions beforehand and um, and whatnot. But uh, what I think's mad about them as well, because I said train there myself, and they, they do like a circuit sometimes. They do a workout, and like I'm done the workout. I'm like ready for fucking. I sit down, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then and then the boxers come in and train, and I'm just like. How the fuck have you just you know? It's crazy because I come in every every day and they've already been in for the last two hours. That's training. what I mean. Like they've been, so I like I normally start at ten o'clock in the morning, but they've been in since eight, so they've done a two hour session and then like I don't leave the gym until one, so they they then train us for two and a half hours. Mm. Um, it's a credit to themselves. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're they're great coaches, great people, and they they put the work in. Do you know what I mean? And you, you see a lot of coaches just turn up to do pads and whatever else, mm. but. They're, they're coaches that always want to learn do you know what I mean Joe I've not seen a coach like Joe in terms of like he literally there was like four opponents um, discussed for my next fight and he's gone on he's watched every single one of their fights he's watched the training sessions he's, do you know what I mean he's, and he's then come to me and broke down 
certain things that they're doing and, and do you know what I mean and that gives you great confidence in your coach you know what I mean someone that's a, a real student of the game mm. and, and do you know what I mean he's not just gone and watched one video of him mm. he's watched 20 videos he knows what he, he do you know what I mean? Knows exactly what he does, and um, yeah, he's like I say, he's a, he's a very, very good coach. I'm glad he's doing interviews now because you can tell he doesn't like doing <laughs> them. But there's certain outlets that he will speak to, and like just for someone like me to listen to him, because as you say, then he he, he always, even when he assesses other fights, you know, for for like my job and stuff, he always says stuff where you probably might have missed or other people just aren't saying it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And you can just tell he's got sort of a brain that is just like it's crazy because he's so softly spoken at yeah. all times. <laughs> yeah. and, yeah. But you wouldn't get on the wrong side of him. <laughs> no, no, no I've way. seen him in Declan when they have uh, when they either don't eat the pads for each other or something yeah. like. And I'm like, you used to a fucking scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, that uh, one and two things. Scary. That one and two, like you know, head coach and then a the number two. I know Shane McGuigan does a similar thing with uh, a guy called Josh Pritchard, yeah. doesn't he? I think that is, although it's been around for years, it's such a benefit because as long as they're singing off the same hymn sheet and they're given they the can, same yeah. information, it's almost like you know you're getting you're getting sort of like double the. Mm. Not just the confidence, but it's like you know, yeah. it's just being sent I think home. The main to thing in the gym as well, there's no eagles. Mm. Do, do you know what I mean? There's no like you see a lot of coaches nowadays, and they're very egotistic. Yeah. And it's about them and, and more so than the fighter. And one of the first things Joe said to me that I think it was on the first day is, is that I'm not here to make you look good on the pads. I'm here to make you a better fighter. Do you know what I mean? And that speaks volumes. He's not here to do all the fancy stuff for social media. He's here to break it down and and do the hard work and. Um, improve me as a fighter and that obviously even the first day gave me great confidence and that I've made the right decision mm. to, to go with Joe that coaching they said they say there's like a boxing coach and a box, boxing teacher isn't he and I mean like you know anyone these days can be a boxing coach I think Instagram has literally got yeah. both well that's it I always, I always say it's, there's a difference between a coach and a trainer yeah. someone can train you you can train a dog do you know what I mean but to coach somebody, to care for somebody, to yeah. man manage somebody, do you know what I mean? A coach isn't just teaching yeah. them boxing. It, there's a lot of factors that, that play into it. And um, for me, Joe, Joe's a very, very good coach, him and mm. What's your career now looking like then? So is, what's the plan then to obviously be in Liverpool for another foreseeable? Is it just for your camp? I mean, where's your kind of the next... Kind <sighs> do you know what's a tough one? I love going. Belfast so much. And I, I've, I've, I think I, I do have a decision to make on... I like being a full-time athlete and um, I do feel, feel like I've got the perfect balance because I can come to camp for like 10 to 12 weeks, train as hard as I possibly can, fight, and then I go home for three, four weeks and just have that downtime with friends and family and then I'm back in camp. So I think it's, it is a good balance. But like I said, I like being in, uh, even though I'm in the gym all the time when I'm back home, it's different when you can, on your off season, you can, or like your downtime, you can be in the gym actually learning and improving. So I feel like now I do have a decision whether I'm going to move to Liverpool full time or not but in terms of boxing I'll be out before the end of the year I'm going to have news dropping over this week or next week um, so one more big fight before the end of the year uh, to find my, my WBA title and then I want to push on to European level next year Try and get you selling out the um, the, the yeah, that would be unbelievable yeah. <laughs> I, I, do you know I thought my next fight was going to be in Liverpool as well it was discussed it might be in Liverpool unfortunately it's not but I can't wait to fight back in here mm. back in Liverpool now that I'm training here as well it makes it so much more special for me and um, yeah I feel like this will be this will be a city that, that will um, mm. get behind me and, and obviously to, to fight here be special I, mean, I think they, I genuinely think they will I mean just sitting with you for an hour and a half or whatever you've done mm. you a lot of the way you talk the way you act the way you carry yourself is very reminiscent to somebody from the yeah. city and I think once people start to hear your story start to see it in the city I think you'll probably get the same treatment that mm. a scouts fighter yeah. gets and you know you'll have seen it yourself when no no Joe's called me the scouts for this, so <laughs> yeah. you're going to yeah. have to change that you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you uh, experienced much of uh, Evan Hills yeah no, no <laughs> have you not done no, them yeah no, no. No, not yeah. yet. not yet. We were actually meant to do it last week, and then it started yeah. started raining. Thankfully, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's like boxer central athletes. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's quite an um. I think everyone who's played any sport at any level in Liverpool has been taken to them hills at one oh, point. Yeah. Usually at like five a.m. just yeah. to make it worse. <laughs> but it's um. Don't look forward to it. No, <laughs> but no, it'd be a uh, yeah. Looking forward to watching the rest of your career, mate. Obviously, and now with a vested interest, obviously, would you be in yeah. part of our little alumni and also an adopted scouser? So yeah. Yeah, it's an exciting time. Maybe anything else you want to touch upon? Or? Um, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm grateful for you having me on and I appreciate it. I genuinely loved it, mate. Uh, top fella. And yeah, like George said, mate, excited for the future. We'll be there next fight. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Nah, Thanks cheers. Fun. Thank you.